those of you oh. who are on. So it's just a couple of questions, um, just to give us a bit of an idea about where you guys are at with your um, gaming and live streaming, what interaction you've had. Um, Hi, Daniel. <laughs> okay, there's loads of people with us. Um, so yes, I'm going to try and launch onto YouTube as we go through. So just give me a little bit of time with that. Um, those of you watching Zoom should have that poll popping up. And uh, if you're not familiar with Zoom, although I'm guessing everyone is by now, along the bottom, there's the chat option so that you can open that up so that you can see the questions or comments as you're coming in. Um, well, really comment throughout. We've got a couple of questions in the presentation so that we can get um, a better idea of what's, what's happening for you guys in, in your live streaming and gaming. Um, and then also feel free to ask questions throughout. And what we will do is we will come back at the end on those questions um, so that we can address those so Tom Tom's obviously willing to share his expertise um, for those of you who've not crossed paths with him before though I imagine many of you have Tom is from Tiltify and he is my go-to guru for everything live streaming and gaming he is wonderful um, and he's been very patient with me because this is a subject that's definitely terrified and confused me for at least the last year where it's been discussed more frequently in the sector um, so Tom's coached me through this given me advice which um, today he will do so for all of you. I know there will be um, a lot of different experience levels so some of you will be new to new to this area others will already be running campaigns um, but we'll aim to give you more thorough no knowledge of, of gaming and live streaming and um, tips on enhancing your fundraising activities across this area, as well as wrapping up with a couple of ways to influence your senior leadership team to get investment on and generally buy in. Um, so that is the lovely Tom, who some of you already know. Um, and then for those of you who've not worked with myself before, um, I'm Ashby of Ashby Jenkins Recruitment. Um, so we are traditionally a recruitment agency. We've been around for the last 18 months um, and we're established to offer for an ethical and relationship-led approach to recruitment. We specialise in the digital fundraising and innovation roles across the UK. That's normally our bread and butter, but obviously since lockdown and a lot of recruitment freezes, we've been creative and innovated. And um, this kind of webinar series is one of the ways we've been aiming to support the sector, um, along with a series of, of blogs on our website, which I'll, I'll share the link afterwards. Um, some of you would have been to our previous webinars. We've got another one next week on adapting your traditional fundraising channels and there's still about 10 spaces left on that. So do get signing up. Um, and then alongside that, we're also facilitating mentoring partnerships. So if you're feeling isolated or you feel like you've got a gap in your skill set in um, and as fundraising adapts to the modern socially distanced world, feel free to get in touch with me and I'll see if I can put you in contact with someone who can provide help. And advice. So I'm just going to end the polling now. Thank you everyone for taking part in that. Um, Tom, can you see the results or shall I tell you? No, I can't. Well, that's because I like to be mysterious. So um, we asked people, has your charity or have your charity previously run a gaming fundraiser? And 88% of attendants have said no. So oh. this will be a really interesting one for all of all of you. Um, and um, the second question will come on to at the end, which is around leadership. Um, so, yes. So, Tom, shall we head into the slides? Why that... not? Let's go crazy. Fine. Let's um, let's get into that. So I'm just going to. Now, show... I have warned Ashby that I have a horrible tendency to uh, just not stop talking. So, Ashby, please interrupt me. Uh, every given opportunity because <laughs> otherwise I will not shut up that's fine I often enjoy enjoy that anyway you know I like telling people to shut up any excuse is very good for me so this is You're great. welcome in advance um, I think we'll bounce off each other lovely don't you worry Tom you'll be fine yeah. um so I'll hand over to you and I'll just kind of interrupt at various points with questions and thoughts and stuff like that cool uh so I've called this how to not host a gaming fundraising event um, for a multitude of reasons. Um, and uh, well, w which we will cover off uh, awesome. on this, but I think we need to first, for those, I know there are some people who have heard of Tiltify or have come across us. Um, I think the first slide is, what is Tiltify? <laughs> uh, which I'll tell you. So it, um, you can go click, I think one, two, three, four times or however many it is. There, stop there. There we go, perfect. So. Uh, Tiltify is a fundraising platform uh, for the socially conscious generation, uh, that is to say young people. Um, we typically target uh, people under the age of about 
35, the uh, millennial Gen Z market. Although it is worth noting that the oldest millennials are turning 40 this year, so they are no longer just, just crazy young people. Um, we uh, see these people who are fundraising uh, see themselves as activists as well as fundraisers. So they have uh, large reach on social channels. They might have hundreds, if not thousands of followers on Twitter and, and YouTube, TikTok as well, of course. And we've got, well, who that makes me a millennial, brilliant, <laughs> thanks Alicia. <laughs> Um, and uh, what we see is, is sort of the Greta Thunbergs, if you like, where people don't want to just solve a problem by throwing money at it. They want to uh, engage their friends and family and audiences. They want to get passionate about things and excited. So often when I see a charity's website when there's an appeal on, right now is a beautiful example, uh, they will have, um, you know, donate now, uh, 10, 50, 100 pounds to this problem now please and and that is the ask uh what we found through quite a lot of research and, and doing this sort of stuff is the younger generation want to be able to click start fundraising so yes they could potentially donate 50 pounds they might have more than that they could give away but they would rather utilize their audience of 10 to 10 million people to uh to each get them to donate 10 pounds each um and yet often we're not asking people to engage in that way um, so it was, it was founded, uh, just, I'll just briefly go over those brands just before you skip ahead. So T Tiltify was founded sort of on the basis of Twitch. Um, I'll just give you a quick history lesson for those of you who don't know. For those of you who have heard me talk before, you can tune out for about 30 seconds while I blitz through the history of the internet. So Twitch uh, was originally called Justin TV or Justin.tv. It was founded by a guy called Justin who wanted to broadcast himself online. Uh, in 2011 or 12, I suddenly forget, Google put in a bid to buy Twitch, as he renamed it, uh, for a hundred million US dollars. He turned down that offer, uh, which Amazon countered with a billion US dollars and sold it. Uh, YouTube and Google not being happy with this, then invested in YouTube Live, which about 18 months later came out to varying degrees of success. Uh, Facebook then introduced Facebook Live along with not long after Instagram Live and Mixer came along. Mixer is owned by Microsoft. It is ultimately the same as Twitch but owned by Microsoft. TikTok uh, is the latest player in the game. They uh, were founded or sort of more officially last July so they're not even a year old yet but they are taking the world by storm. Twitter, I'm sure you're familiar with, they've dipped in and out of the live streaming market and there's pros and cons to all of these which if if someone wants to ask the question, I will go over them, but I won't go now. <laughs> um, Discord is a communications channel, which I thoroughly recommend charities getting involved in. It is where the gaming and creative and arts and crafts, and it's a bit like people hang out. It's a bit like Slack meets WhatsApp meets Teams, but anyone can take part. And they, are, they form these amazing communities of people who are deeply passionate about things and close close things and a number of charities have their own discord groups um so it's worth having a look into that as well next slide oh gosh this is where i know is. i caught Here you off guard go. sorry <laughs> so um in the uk uh, it's estimated about 45 million uh active social media users which to put it in you can bring all of those up uh in the grand scheme of things is roughly um everyone in the country if you consider that you have to be 13 to be on most uh, social media platforms and then an older demographic also will not be on there so once you rule out roughly about 15 to 20 million people everyone is on it you get me um globally youtube has a third of the population of the world tiktok is now at 800 million monthly users which is just staggering twitch is actually it keeps going up is now on 30 million visitors a day there's if you are not familiar with Twitch, your homework is to visit Twitch, spend a couple of hours on it, have it on in the background. Um, but with Twitch, there was something really interesting. Oh, there's a category on there. So they've got lots of different categories, things like um, Fortnite as a game, uh, Mario Kart as a game, but, and then they'll have different things like arts and crafts or just chatting, which is effectively podcasts. In the last month since the COVID disaster has struck, um, it has doubled in capacity. It used to average around 100,000 viewers at any given point, and it's now re averaging around 200,000 viewers at any given point, which is wow. a phenomenal amount of people tuning in constantly. Yeah. Uh, so I also actively recommend if you as a charity, outside of 
all of the stuff I'm talking about, if you don't have a Twitch channel, at very least, visit twitch.tv and register your name so no one else gets it. Um, in the same way that when Twitter first came out, you probably should have gone on there and, <laughs> <laughs> and registered your name so no one else gets it. Uh, so thoroughly recommend that. Um, yeah, that, that'll, that'll summarize on there. There we go. Oh, this is Discord. I was going to talk briefly about Discord. I forgot about this. This is uh, Special Effects Discord. No, you can, you can okay. stay on that page. It's fine. Can't remember if it plays a video or not. But this is effectively what it looks like. And uh, the reason I put included this on here is because a lot of people won't necessarily use um, Discord or have ever seen it before. So yeah, this is sort of how it works. They've got different chats. You can see announcements. So when the charity wants to make an announcement, the entire community can see it at once. So rather than sending out newsletters and emails that you would normally do with the community, these guys can just ping them a notification. It's kind of like having a, a WhatsApp group where you are the administrator and not, and so some channels everyone can talk, some channels no one can talk apart from the, the head host, all of that sort of stuff. So it's a very, very powerful tool. Um, and I would thoroughly recommend you going down that rabbit hole. What slide do we have next? Ah, yes, this one. Some campaigns, so successful yes. campaigns. Yes, yes, successful campaigns. So these, apart from this one, that was in April. Uh, Come on, I saw, I saw Kate in the chat. Hi, Kate. Um, and Marie Curie. Hi, guys. Uh, <laughs> I, I found out that they joined earlier, so <laughs> I, I hadn't pre-planned this, and I felt a bit embarrassed because I don't like sort of. Uh, well, <laughs> okay. I, I can confirm um, that. <laughs> I, told, I brought it to the party late. I told him that you were joining late. So, <laughs> but these are these are really good examples of uh, gaming, but also in a way that um, it may might not be necessarily what we would consider gaming. So I've had. We, I don't think we're asking this question. Are we asking a question of what do people think games are? I don't think we are. Are well, we? We hadn't asked that question, but we can no. in the chat. Why not, guys? Why don't you comment what okay, you, think, yeah, let's, what you yeah. thought gaming was before? Imagine you've not seen this slide. And Tom <laughs> hadn't said it's not just all about traditional gaming. Imagine that. What kind of uh, what came to mind? When what you is a game? Gaming? Yeah, <laughs> when you think of gaming fundraising, like what do you see as being successful or good or or um, yeah. It's right. Uh, we'll see. Live streaming video games, either alone or in groups. Yeah, that's that's definitely a, a fair. The live streaming video video games is where what people often summarise gaming as actually is quite an interesting thing. Um, <laughs> so the Dungeons and Dragons one. Dungeons and Dragons. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Dungeons and Dragons is a really lovely example of gaming um, online in a way that. Uh, if you think about it, actually is not gaming at all, but also is. So for those of you who don't know, Dungeons and Dragons is a storytelling game. Uh, yeah, another great example, Assassin's Creed, Minecraft, Minecraft are all things that, that kids plug into. Yeah, absolutely. So Dungeons and Dragons is a storytelling game, uh, a bit like if you used to read the Choose Your Own Adventure books where you have someone who plays the dungeon master uh, who says, right, the four of you have landed in a desert. You don't know anything around you, but you notice something in the distance. What would you like to do? And, <laughs> and then the players will decide what they want to do. We, we're going to actively avoid it. We're going to go and approach it. And it, it plays out like that. Now, last year, Comic Relief in America did a Dungeons and Dragons stream with a comedian called Stephen Colbert, and it did fabulously well. Um, and I was so delighted to see that Comic Relief over here was able to sort of do something in a similar, in a similar vein. They did some fabulous questions to the audience. So before the live, before it went out, they asked questions saying like, uh, I, one of them from memory, I think was like, what would you like to see? Uh, who would you like to see have, have some sort of a punishment against them or something like that? And you had these four comedians there and Nish Kumar won fantastically with over a thousand pounds donated to just watch him suffer. Uh, although there was lots of money raised for all of the other people as well. Um, and then they used these little blue dots along the top, these milestones, uh, which I will talk about later, but they had some fabulous ones. And at one point, I think Ed Gamble had to call... Um, Oh God, what's them? Greg Davis, uh, for advice on how to play because that was something they decided in game and they just very quickly amended it and it was hilarious fun to watch. Um, and then the Marie Curie one, uh, which uh, tune in tonight, 8.15, big shout out. <laughs> whoop, whoop. Uh, just go Google Marie Curie quiz, you'll find it. Um, this was from last week. It made the news. It was fantastic. And I've seen them on the news a lot recently. Uh, quiz is gaming. Um, and again, it's, it's about sort of breaking down these barriers and, uh, uh, and thinking these things through. This, for me, uh, I think I've said this to Marie Curie guys. So, oh, I've had a delivery come to the door. Oh, well, it's being avoided. <laughs> the beauty is <laughs> working. Um, with uh, with Marie Curie, um, we had some really interesting conversations about what platform to use because they were quite keen to use YouTube or Facebook and this sort of stuff. But settled on Twitch, 
So this was broadcast on Twitch, obviously embedded into a fundraising page. And as you can see here, they've used polls and rewards, which we'll look at in a second. But um, it seemed that, you know, they managed to raise over 50 grand on this. The audience didn't actually, they, they didn't seem, it would appear, to be put off by the, um, the platform. And so something that might seem fairly uh, disengaging to us, uh, what we've seen a lot of is people willing to make changes. Pe people are learning to Zoom now, you know, people are willing to understand that they, they're going to have to adapt, adopt and improve. And this is a wonderful example of uh, a community of people who joined in to take part in this fabulous quiz um, uh, in, in a way that they probably a year ago wouldn't have taken that risk to do. So That's really, it. really cool. Sorry, to, um, just to add it, because I and Marie Curie is, is obviously on here, but in terms of their audience, I would guess they're not traditionally your kind of who you would envision gamers as being that I'm guessing they're not kind of your your 20 to 35 year olds or whatever. Absolutely. I mean, I, I, I won't go into too much detail because I, I don't want to steal anyone's thunder, but um, my understanding, and you can see this, is Marie Curie doesn't have a particularly large following on Twitch. It's not their, their, their personal platform. I can see Thomas uh, in the chat has asked this. So it was totally new to them as far as my understanding. They've got a wonderful audience on Facebook and Twitter, and they've done a really good job of social. So they just made sure they directed people into the right place. And this is uh, it, it a sort of a common misconception that you have to be huge on Twitch in order to be successful. And that's not really true. You need to have uh, a great, oh, hi, Sarah. Um, a uh, great um, social media presence. Anywho, um, so they use rewards and polls. Let's have a look at some of those. I love this and I'm looking forward to seeing what they put up later today. Uh, so for their rewards, so fabulous. I love this. Donate a hundred pounds. Oh, sorry, Tom, just out. for those of you that can't see the chat, you should, there, there should be, if you move your mouse, there should be a bar that comes up along the bottom, which says chat, which should then come up on your right hand side. Uh, that should bring that up. I've not had problems with that before. Um, I, I can see. Come on, that Sarah. I know you know how technology works. Come on, you've got this. <laughs> only sending to YouTube. Oh, okay. Yeah, some people are um, adding through questions. <laughs> um, Tom, I, I ex explicitly ban berating of participants during these webinars. You can't. You can't shame anyone. Anyway. Um, yeah. So that some of you are asking questions on our question and answer section. If you pop them in the chat, that's easier for us to see. So that would be great. And you should. Um, yeah, on the chat, you should change it to all panelists and attendees rather than just panelists so nice. hopefully that will help you see more of the more of the things sorry i should have explained that nuance as we started carry on tom so talk, you were talking through the um the great stuff they were doing and the rewards they'd set up glorious yeah no so well, i mean i love these rewards that they set up and i'll talk a lot more about how these things work and why they interact but so good a hundred pounds get a shout out from mr punch mr punch was like this this <laughs> horrible puppet that she had made and uh, people donated a hundred pounds you can see it sold out um and every time someone donated a hundred pounds this puppet would come up and give a shout out to the person and equally get a shout out from pamela um which people again just like this is this is gorgeous uh, and really really interactive she is a so she is an influencer um she is not 21 years old and a youtuber and oh my god a like and subscribe at the end of my show and all this sort of stuff she's just a regular person broadcasting live and absolutely smashing it out of the park and doing it very very well and so this is the sort of stuff that i'm really hoping uh, well and we are seeing and hoping to see more you can see also she asked the polls uh, what's uh what is alison's favorite ever moment in gavin and stacy this question raised over ten thousand pounds how awesome is that like just because we've given people another way to donate and this is what's really key uh and, and we'll come on to a bit is that um People like to interact. People like to engage with, with other things. They like to see things happening in real time. So you need to be able to offer the ability to do that. And that's what these sort of little tips and tricks can do. Um, next slide. Yay, okay. Ooh. Oh yeah, I forgot about this one. <laughs> I mean, no, I didn't. I wrote this. Oh, uh, so this is... <laughs> He's really organized. We ran through this last night. He knows what's coming up. He's just, he's just playing with you. I built the damn <laughs> Um, so this is Colo and she is a fabulous streamer. She did her first charity stream back in February, I think this one was. She had an original target of a thousand pounds. Her viewing ship, I think if you click a button something happens. Yeah, her followers on Twitch is 20,000. So that is not particularly big, but it's decent. Um, 
And uh, then, oh yeah, uh, I can't remember what she's going to say, but she absolutely smashed a target and she went away and above and beyond. And why is that? She wasn't playing games. At no, like she barely played games on her stream. Yes, she likes games, but she herself is a wonderfully entertaining person. There's a video that, um, Kath, uh, that Ashby will send out um, in an e a follow email afterwards with uh, a sort of like an overview of, of her fundraising attempt. I was going to put it in here and I thought, nah, it's five minutes long. We don't have five minutes to spare on watching a YouTube video. Uh, but you guys can do that afterwards. Uh, thoroughly, thoroughly recommend looking at it because um, it shows you how she did it. It shows you what she did to get to that 18,000 from smashing her original target 18 times more than she expected. Um, and and she, she just made this sort of compilation video herself. It's fabulous. Um, so I think that we get the next one is your image of a charity that's tried to be a bit true to traditional. Oh yeah, I chose an American one so as not to be <laughs> mean to anyone. So you're welcome, everyone. Um, so this is an American charity. Um, they are a large charity in America, and this is their page for um, for to try and entice gamers into fundraising. And you might be able to click play on this actually. I don't think I put sound on it. God, I hope I didn't. Um, if it is, it will just be me breathing. But you can see here they've it's it's fairly generic. We've got a video in the text there. I don't know if you can read it because I've got it covered up by chat. But it says um, if you would like to be where does it say it? Oh, first line. We are building a cancer-fighting army led by Twitch community leaders. Now, what they've done there is in that first slide that I spoke about, um, Twitch is big, but it's not the only place these people hang out. Um, there are a lot of other places that people like to interact. Not everyone wants to go live. Some people want to do pre-recorded content and they raise lots of money. You had uh, last December, there was... Um, oh, Damn it, I've forgotten his name. Ah, not Markiplier. I did a thing called Trees. Sorry, my brain is completely farted on me. Uh, he, he raised 20 million anyway through pre recorded video content. Mr. Beast, thanks, Sarah. <laughs> Helping me out every step of the way. Sarah's fabulous. You should, uh, everyone should follow her on Twitter um, <laughs> or something like that. Uh, but yeah, so Mr. Beast raised, uh, got, brought his communities together. They raised 20 million to plant loads and loads of trees. Um, but the majority of that was pre-recorded content, which is really, really interesting. Um, and so that, uh, if this was here, uh, oh, Max, you're absolutely right. Like Mr. Beast is an absolute legend. And Mr. Beast, Jack Septicai, um, Dr. Lupo, all of these people I'll talk about, like add them to your research list. Don't try and approach them to fundraise for you because they just won't, but definitely do your research and check them out. Uh, next page. So, oh, I've covered up the entire screen by chat, so I can't actually see what it says. Main so types of fundraising. Yes. Oh, yes. Excellent. I'd use two screens, but then if this goes over here, I can't, I'm not looking at the camera anymore. So this is influence fundraising. We, I, say, I say three types of live stream digital fundraising in this sphere, creative fundraising, if you will. And, and the first one is influence. So this is uh, Dr. Lupo, and he did a fundraiser just before Christmas, uh, and as you can see here, raised over $2 million. Uh, he's got his, his, we've got here the top donor list on the side. You're getting very bus and heavy, uh, happy here. <laughs> top donor list on the side. So people, anyone who's donated the, the most amount appears on this list. So it's immediate live interaction, just like a telethon, really. Mm. Um, and if you click on the next thing, now you can bring this up. You can see on Twitter, he's got 1.6 million followers. And I think on... Uh, the next one, he's got something like 30 million followers on, uh, what's it called? We went straight into Jack Septicai. Oh yeah, I culled them all out because that. You've also got Jack Septicai, a spectacular streamer. He fundraises once every two or three months. As you can see, uh, 24 million subscribers on YouTube. So if you're only targeting Twitch on this, you've suddenly kicked out this guy. Um, and every time, you can see here, it's a little blurry, but he typically fundraises between 100 and two hundred thousand dollars each time and his total there uh is over is nearly three million dollars that he's raised he started fundraising three years ago um and if someone said to you oh we've got a youtuber that wants to do some fundraising for you would you say i've never heard of him i'm not interested or would you do your research and just be like oh okay he's got a bit of a following maybe we should investigate this a bit further and i have that conversation a lot with charities where um i'll get phone calls from people saying oh yeah you know a, a charity that uh, influencer is chosen 
and they'll say, oh yeah, we've heard from this guy, Jack Sepsky, I don't really know him, but he wants to do a fundraiser for us. He said, I have to sign up to this platform, but I don't really know what I'm doing. And then I will explain and go through a sort of a, a bit of a thing, say, oh, this is definitely a good thing. You do want to have him uh, on board, but often, you know, he's you know we're not his target audience necessarily um, Tom, um, someone's put in the questions around gaining influencers and i know we've talked about this but oh yes before. let's talk um so so what's what's your best advice for organizations that are thinking oh great yeah it would be lovely to get jack sector jack sector guy to do uh do a fundraiser for us what's what's your advice brilliant question and leads me so perfectly um not on to the next one so stay on the slide um when so uh one of in the gaming sphere in the gaming world um and in charity there's a charity called st jude's hospital in america they are by and large the one of the most successful fun charities that fundraise through this type of fundraising they do something it's live right now called play live i think it's tapping it's going to get to about three million by the end of the month we're hoping um and it's, it's doing spectacularly now uh dr lupo started fundraising for them uh about four years ago i.e when he wasn't famous um he's gone through the ranks but as a charity with their they've got a digital community manager there they've been working with all of the people and supporting them along the way and because the charity has supported him he continues to support them mm -hmm. so just like you might be thinking about how you would engage with um sort of low-level celebrities or musicians or artists or anything else like that do treat these with some really fascinating things um I've just seen another question come up about UK charities, which I will come to because there is a there's an interesting thing, but I'll come to that later if that's all right. Yeah, sorry. Um, so uh, what I would say is probably don't try and approach them necessarily unless you can see a direct link. Mm -hmm. um, the the better advice would be to you know reach far and wide. So you know from your main social channel rather than creating a separate social channel. Say, guys, we we're doing this event. Um, we would love for everyone to come on board and and get that message out. Don't treat it like it's a separate event. Treat it like it's in the same way that you would market a bike ride. You wouldn't just market a bike ride in, you know, if you're doing London to Brighton, for example, you wouldn't just put that in Top Cyclists magazine. You're wanting to target everyone to take part in that event because you don't know who's going to take part or who's going to raise the most amount of money. Mm. And yes, wouldn't it be wonderful to get... Um, Chris Hoy, he's a cyclist, I think, uh, yeah. to, to, do a, to, a, um, to do an event for you. But, but realistically, it would also be really, really good just to get someone who's been a big supporter of your charity to take part. So, so don't, um, don't feel you should only focus on these big people, which ne leads me neatly on to the next slide. I mean, it doesn't, it needs me on to the next one after that, but we'll talk about esports now. So something I have a lot of conversations about is esports and how successful it can be and could be and should be, etc. Now, this has been a bit of a learning curve for a lot of people and charities. There's a few examples in here. Um, but we, I don't know what the right answer is yet because this is such new territory. But the community who watch esports, what we found is they don't give very much. So when a esports team gets in touch, uh, and says, you know, we've got 100,000 viewers uh, who are going and we want to do a charity fundraiser for you. That might be a question to say, oh my God, this would be awesome. We've got, we've got an audience of 100,000 people. We're going to ask lots of questions. But with these esports stars, a lot of the time, they are very, very talented at playing games, but they're not particularly talented at engaging with audiences. They're not presenters. They are sports personalities. And in the same way that you might not necessarily want David Beckham hosting Comic Relief, although I'm sure he'd be spectacular at it, um, he's probably a bad example because he's quite an entertaining fellow, but you wouldn't necessarily want a pro sports personality hosting a big fundraiser because they're going to miss out on some of the key questions that needed to be asked to the audience. And uh, potentially, you know, their, their, their key skill isn't entertainment. Whereas uh, with the influences and the next one that I'm coming to, which I don't go to yet, but which I'm coming to, uh, people are more about, it's about engaging with the audience and the ask. So where does the money come from in esports? Big corporate sponsorships. And that's what we want to see. This was one that happened, uh, but oh, actually, yeah, this is quite a sad one. Uh, so this was something, the celebrity esports thing. They had this goal of raising a hundred million for the NHS, which is a lovely, lovely ambition, but people often 
look at esports and think that it's going to be really easy and it's not it's so so hard um and i think they're currently you know they they've they've had to reduce their target quite significantly which is really sad to see because it would have been wonderful to have raised that but to get this sort of fundraising if you've got 100,000 people watching man united versus man city right so we've got like an a list thing that people want to watch and you want to make that a charity fundraiser um, but it's already part of a premiership challenge or whatever, people aren't going to donate. They're not there for your charity. They're there for the, the event. Whereas um, it, what is very tempting, yes, next slide will be fine, is um, to look at something like this, which is the EA Sports FIFA. That, now this raised over a million, uh, but nearly a million of that is through corporate donations because they want their name to be affiliated with the event. If you've got 100,000 people watching an event for four hours straight, you want your brand against that. And people will pay top dollar to be affiliated with this sort of thing. So if you do start going down this road, don't necessarily just focus um, on what the community are going to give. Yes, absolutely try. Do some stuff. Try and engage. I'm not saying that. But do look at um, you know, where the real values are lying. And Tom, outside of esports, does would corporate involvement be something that's possible? So with taking yeah. the two examples, so the comic relief Dungeon and Dragons and Marie Curie, could their corporate fundraising of team have gone out to corporate partners and said, well, look, we can get your branding out to maybe 10,000 people or 5,000 people? Absolutely. Well, well, yeah, I mean, cor the corporate engagement here is real. like, I know corporate fundraisers are having a real tough time of it at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, and while some businesses are doing well, others are not so much. And uh, to be able to get corporate sponsorship in front of a brand new audience that they haven't had before is is fabulous. Like I, I mean, this the the Marie Curie stream as an example. You know, I this was, it hasn't had a year in the planning and stuff like that. You know, some often these sort of events have a lot of planning <laughs> behind them, and it was and they've done a spectacular job of building something very quickly. Um, but uh, I think I, I read somewhere that they had about 20,000 people watching at one point. Okay. Now, who, wh what of their corporate partners might want to be affiliated with that? We, I mean, this is, this is a question that I, we don't know the answer to, but it's an interesting concept to play with. Additionally, this type of fundraising works really well with corporates in the workplace. And actually, that takes us neatly on to the next question. That Community. Yeah. <laughs> 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 it's a slick mm. transition Tom I like so it <laughs> so um and I, I it was only about 10 minutes when we were on this call I was like oh I forgot to mention that corporates do kind of count as community fundraising lots of way um corporates come with their own communities and a lot of them are working from home right now and things like the bake sales and the dress down days and all these sort of things are kind of still happening in various different guises and actually this type of fundraising lends itself really nicely to um to, to this type of fundraising things like being able to vote on polls you know being able to just tweet out a fundraising poll or, or rather stick in the microsoft teams i should say keep it internal uh, of you know what color should our ceo dye his hair for the friday conference call or something like that and just get the whole team you know get 200 staff or whatever voting on that to make the ceo do something silly is wonderful um actually sarah who's in the chat did a nice little test with her charity to see what would happen and I think she raised over 200 quid or something like that. Hi again Sarah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's because I've seen you in the chat now so I'm just going to pick on you. Oh 16 grand wow. Shut that's up. Amazing. What? Really? Holy Moses okay oh. fine check you out so corporate does well. <laughs> Maybe I should have had Sarah on as a panelist as well. Yeah oh my goodness great. okay. Oh great okay. Ha ha. So Sarah, right? Okay, so that's what I was going to talk about as well. <laughs> at all. Um, it might. Anyway, community. Sorry, yeah, in that on. case, no. I was going to say, Sarah, I'll reach out to you at the end of this because it might be worth us um, just having a quick call, and then I can send round what happened to everyone else if you don't mind sharing. Um, that is hot gossip. I love, wow, love hot gossip. Great. Sorry, uh, and also, sorry, just that, before you go back, you go back into it, Tom. Yeah. I've put we've put a question down here around: um, mm. Have any of you used the three types of streaming that we've discussed? Which ones? What have the results been? So I know not all of you have um, have tried um, doing the it's kind of online or live streaming fundraising. But if you have, just let us know in the chat what you've done and how well it's worked. That would be really great for us to us to hear. So Tom, sorry, carry on with the community, and then we'll let those. No, it's fine. I'm now like 
I'm I'm torn between like carrying on with this and also researching <laughs> what Sarah's just shared, but I'll I'll stay with the room. Um, so uh, this is a really interesting one, which is the community engagement. So we spoke about at the start the sort of the digital influencer the person who has you know 20 million followers and this sort of thing but this is a lovely example of um fundraising through community where they've raised a thousand pounds from not really doing an awful lot so this guy here i'd never heard of him before that's no offense to him i'm sure he's absolutely wonderful and a perfect person he does a podcast that's cool um he's raised over a grand you can see there his original goal was a hundred quid so what's gone on here now he's been fundraising for mind mind are a recently registered if you click the next slide, we can look at some of the stats. So, uh, oh, I took it out. Never mind. Uh, so <laughs> or have I, am I, no, have I covered it up? I've covered it up with, no, I haven't. No, never mind. Anyway, all I was going to say is um, he has about 200 followers on Twitter, maybe 30 followers on Twitch. Like he hasn't got a huge audience, but his audience are dedicated to him. They love him. So in the same way that on Facebook, how when it first came out, you might have only had like 100 friends, but they were really your friends. So if you asked them to do something, they would, You'd be like, yeah, let's get on this. This would be fun. This is the type of thing that's happening here. This guy is reaching out to his community and people are donating more and more than they might have. Now, what's really cool about this type of fundraising is with a standard fundraiser, no, I'm going to come on to that later. Let's look at, let's look at the community. Let's look at the community. So the next slide here, just another, another example. I took the screenshot on Monday. It's gone up since then. Um, but this is uh, British Red Cross, their fundraiser that they've been doing. Um, and they've been really good at engaging the community. They've, they've put it on there, you can see there, they've um, said it game and support um, of COVID relief. They haven't specified what a game is. Gaming can be anything. So they're not saying, you know, only do it on Twitch or only play Fortnite for a fortnight or something like that. They're saying, just get involved, let's have some fun. Um, and yeah, actually, if you go on to the next slide, you'll see these thousands of numbers here. Uh, I know, like, they haven't actually got that many these are not celebrities who are bringing in this sort of money. Uh, I know Nitinata personally, which is fabulous, um, and she'll typically have between 80 and 100 people viewing at any given point as a standard. She's a Twitch partner, which means that she's got a little purple tick. So she's dedicated to streaming. She streams regularly. But through 80 people, she's managed to raise £1,000. And all she's doing is just hanging out just chatting to the camera, like Ashby and I are doing right now. This in itself could be a charity live stream and probably a very successful one, I'm sure. Um, <laughs> Not to blow uh, our own trumpets, Tom. Yeah, yeah. I don't want to brag, but we are. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, but this is the thing, is that it's the, being able to live interact um, and engage with people who, who really like them. So these people have all done fabulous jobs. Great. Um, I can't remember what the next slide is, so let's see what comes up. Fundraising pages. Um, so... Now this is, this is us talking about fundraising. These are three random pages from three sort of generic fundraising uh, companies from uh, 2009, but they're, they're just quite a nice example of what fundraising pages uh, look like, which I'm sure you have seen before. Uh, they all have three sort of key elements in them. So the first one you've got is an image. An image is very important. It captures uh, the mood, the moment, the passion. Uh, and this Millennium Hambridge walk handstand is a, a beautiful one. Gosh, that looks quite tough and I, I don't want to, <laughs> can't imagine. Also need a donate button, obvious, obvious stuff. Um, and, and then text explaining what that is. And you know, when you're sending an email out to your loved ones to say, hi guys, I'm going to be doing a walk across the Millennium Bridge, will you please sponsor me? You want to be able to include a very simple link that includes a donate now button in the same way that before the internet came along, you'd like to be able to go around your friend's house and ask them to just simply fill out their name and the donation amount and be able to move on. So this is, this is what typically all fundraising pages, I'm not singling anyone out, but all fundraising pages uh, do look at. So if we skip to the next slide, yeah, and that was from a few years ago, those... those 2009, yeah. No, I, I just like to use old examples because I think okay. it's quite interesting to sort of consider this. Um, now, what we need to consider is that our mobile phones, we update every two or three years, and our laptops and computers every four to five years, give or take. So we, we kind of keep our conversation... Uh, sorry, we keep our technology up to date. That, that's what we do. If we go on to the next slide, uh, we can sort of look at some other things that have changed since 2009 when that page uh, was shared. So we've got here um, adults using social media, only 5% in the UK were using it in 2005. Now we're at about 79, 80%. Uh, UK households with broadband in 2005 didn't exist. <laughs> now, it, I couldn't get the latest stats. So 2018, it was 91%. It'll be greater than that now. 
uh, mobile phone usage. Uh, in 2011, two years after the first iPhone was launched, only 29% of people were using smartphones. Now we're at 95%, uh, which is a huge number of people. Popular social media platforms, MySpace and Friendster, hitting 100 million people. Uh, we're now talking about a third of the world's population are on both Facebook and YouTube, which is just shockingly high numbers. Um, and I know we're not still sort of questioning is, is social media a thing we know it's a thing but myspace in its heyday was getting 75 million unique viewers a month tiktok need to update this um this is me not you ashby uh, is on 800 million u- unique users a month which is just mind-blowing not unique sorry fifth, uh, five, uh, 800 million users a month which is absolutely mind-blowing um and if you look at that that came out in july it's not even a year old yet. So that, that's mind blowing. Um, mobile internet speeds were considerably faster. And you know, uh, 4G I think only came along in around 2011 from memory. 5G is obviously just coming around now and we're starting to do this. But if we think back to those fundraising pages from sort of 2009, 2011-ish time, um, they suited, they, they did exactly what they needed to do and they do exactly what they needed to do for the technology that we had at the time. Now. Let's look at the next slide. So this is just a couple of, again, I could choose any fundraising page from around the world. I've just chosen two that you'll be familiar with. Um, The one on the left is uh, Just Giving and the the one on the right is um, Donor Drive, an American fundraising platform. Um, But this this is what's happened, is nothing has changed. So the relationship between the charity and the fundraiser might have changed. They might be slicker, they might have it there. The relationship between uh, being able to set up a fundraising page might be significantly quicker now, which is absolutely important. We need these pages created like that. What has not changed one iota in 20 years of online fundraising is the relationship between the person making the donation and the person receiving the donation. And yet, what we've just explained is that everything else has changed. So this is perfect when you need to send an email out, an email chain to 50 people to say, please make a donation. What this doesn't work for is for a socially active, socially conscious generation. So let's have a look at a little bit more things. Um, it's, this is my favorite. Oh, it's the wheel! <laughs> yeah. oh, my favorite bit. So uh, just if anyone- to emphasize the point. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so this, um, don't, don't click onto the next slide yet. So this don't is like a wheel. Uh, this uh, I, I came up with this for a conference thing that I did a, a few months ago. I was so nervous about doing it, and two people said they liked it. So now I just assume it's the best thing ever. Uh, so this is this is the wheel. It's a wheel. This is uh, from about four thousand BC. No, slightly earlier than that. And it's uh, arguably it's the first ever recorded wheel. Um, what was it used for? Let's have a look. It was used for pottery. Uh, the first ever wheel was used for pottery, and for the first five hundred years, you can go on to the next image as well. The first five hundred years uh, was only used. For this, this is how it was used. People loved the wheel. It was awesome. It was incredible. Um, Imagine the amounts of pots, pots being produced so quickly. Um, Communities love pots. Everyone loves pots. So these wheels were fantastic. But someone, don't know who, came along with something brand new. It is, blam, the axle. It changed everything. The axle changed the game. Let's look at it again. Brand new. Wow. It's got wheels on it. So let's look and see what the axle did. It created the ability to. This is uh, the first wheel that was used with an axle. It was created in Mesopotamia and it was used for choosing things like carrying people. Uh, It could be made out of (laughs) metal or wood, have rubber casing. It could be used to make things go faster. You can attach engines to it to make it go faster. It can pull things. It can help with the access. It can now be used to generate electricity and it can make wool. It can do all of these other things that previously, I don't know what that is, uh, that you could only do with um, this thing originally for 500 years was only being used to make pots. And now it's changed the entire world because of a stick. Everyone gets excited about the invention of the wheel. The wheel was not that exciting. The real excitement was the invention of that tiny little stick, mm. uh, the axle. And that's kind of where um, th- this, this sort of type of fundraising comes in. So yeah, we can have a look at the next bit now. This is, this is what a fundraising page sort of looks like. It's, and it's, also, hard... it's really interesting, Tom, because I think there are the, definitely with the traditional channels like events and community where people mm. have done things the same for a long time and just giving and um, those other kind of um, alternative providers of a similar situation um, have kept things reasonably similar. 
the community teams, challenge event teams haven't had that chance to, or haven't evolved as quickly as and as now we absolutely need to, that we can't gather socially couldn't, in large couldn't numbers. More. I've been amazed at the amount of fun. I mean, following is, is awful at the moment. It really make, breaks my heart. Mm-hmm. And uh, I talk to a lot of charities and, and people, you know, my contacts are changing on a weekly basis and it's, it's horrid. Um, but like I can't believe that charities are choosing to follow fundraisers the one set of people whose job it is is to bring in money um and this you guys are spectacular and so innovative and now is the first time in probably 10 years that people have sincerely had to innovate in order to get income in and and it's just oh, anyway that's a that's a rant for another day no but it's good and I think you know the fact that this has been so popular this particular webinar shows people's real um, desire to learn and and hopefully at the end of this we'll be able to give you kind of ways to then go and influence people that might have been a bit more to do or used to coming up in a really traditional fundraising market so yeah, yeah. sorry this so that i think you're going to go into the features of the pages and yeah well this is this is what's happened so if you think back to what a market fair used to be like let th- cast your back your mind back if you can or if you were even born then uh to 1997 oh what a well actually it was a really sad yeah that was prince diana let's go back to 96 spice world um you had uh, the way of doing fundraising. Imagine you're fundraising for the local church roof or something like that. How would you do that? You'd hold a market fair. You'd do lots of things at a bake sale. You'd have uh, throw the sponge at the head teacher. You'd do all of this sort of stuff. Online fundraising came along. Now, I would never criticize online fundraising because it has changed the world, arguably. I mean, the likes of Just Giving are spectacular and have done an incredible job of changing the way we consider and think about giving. Um, it, but things need to need to keep changing and so what we've done is effectively gone e- way back and looked at how people were fundraising beforehand uh, before the but in the before times before the internet um, and said like are there ways that we can incorporate this into fundraising pages so twitch streamers this is we, we were born on twitch twitch streamers they have to make their own money so a lot of people will have uh, subscribers or followers take taking part and tuning in who um, they will uh, give them money so for example i might be sat here doing a broadcast right now we've got what 90 people watching or something like that and i would say guys i am feeling hungry uh now if i could get 10 people right now to donate one pound to me that's enough for a pizza and then what i'll do is i'll share my screen of the pizza arriving from domino's and and then i'll eat it so if you want to see that happen, uh, donate a pound. Let's see what happens. And then people will donate a pound and then we'll watch that. But what they're doing is they're incentivizing their audience. They're not just saying, I'll do a marathon when I get to 2000. They're doing it, they're saying this sort of stuff. And so what we saw is that people were these effectively becoming natural fundraisers from a non-fundraising perspective. And all we did was adopt what they were already doing and putting it into a charity perspective. So the first thing is these milestones, these little blue dots across the top here, which I briefly spoke about, but what they do is that they trigger things so like when i get to a thousand pounds i'll shave my head or whatever gotcha. um these no that's fine we can go on to this uh, you've got targets which people can uh they're totally customizable um where people can set a donation amount if this target is here i will action this thing this is a very gaming specific one but we do them you know people do them for runs or for all sorts of things um and with the live streaming right now uh, i'm thinking of you know people who would have been able to take part in the marathon unable to we had a couple of people doing some treadmill runs which is which is great but they'd already done their fundraising so what's the incentive to give to them again while they're live broadcasting um what we we've seen with fundraising is if you, ashby congratulations you've got a place in 2021 london marathon congratulations uh you have asked me to donate to you uh, and i will donate 10 pounds congratulations you're welcome as well uh, and I don't want to hear from you. I don't want to hear anything about it until after you've finished it with a picture of you crossing the finish line, which I will like on Facebook. And that is going to be my relationship with you. And that's uh, eight months down the line or whatever. Now, with live streaming fundraising and the sort of engaging fundraising, what we're looking at is um, you might do one of these targets. You know, when this target is full, um, I, I will uh, dye my eyebrows purple. Or with the milestones, you know, when I hit this milestone, I'll do something. Um, and so where I would have given you £10 before, I might give you £5. But I might give you that £5 five or six times over because I want to interact with all of these different things because I'm just having a great time. So that's targets. Um, the next just, two, say, just in terms of time, oh, we've got another te- 10 minutes, so we'll need to breeze through these. I'm going to splash through this. Okay, rewards, it's like your online shop. You can just buy shut <laughs> stuff. 
<laughs> Sorry, I, I've tried to go as quickly as I can. But you can effectively buy stuff and incentivize things. They are set donations amounts. So they are, you know, five pounds, you get this. You can increase the donation, but um, you'll get something for it. And the last one is the one we've covered before, which is polls. Um, uh, and uh, this was uh, Dungeons Dragons stream, where effectively you ask questions and people vote on them, which when you've got people like Twitch, uh, sorry, like Twitter, where Twitter polls happen all the time, Facebook polls happen all the time. People are very familiar with how polls work. So why shouldn't they be available for charity fundraising? Obviously they should be. So we just did it and they've, they've proven really, really successful and very popular. Yeah. Uh, and also it. all of those little tricks keep people more engaged means they watch for longer they stay more active they give more oh, so we, it's really useful to we see people donating on the polls time and time again so it'll take a little bit of time to get get off but if you say the poll closes at 12 um someone who donated 10 pounds suddenly you'll get people in fact it was that first one there someone dropped a thousand pounds because they're of dollars in this case because they really wanted to see that holy sword speak like your hype man so they did it just before the poll closed they dropped a thousand pounds dollars so you get stuff like that happening quite a lot because it's exciting and hilarious so yeah yeah, consider these people major donors, celebrities, don't just write them off. Wonderful. And in terms of, so kind of coming up to our last slide and then we'll take, we'll take a couple of questions so that um, Lydia, I'll come back to yours because I've seen that, that would be a useful one to, to address. So to, on tips for securing investment and managing expectations. So of, um, there are people on this that are obviously at manager level, will be at head of level, but we'll need to, to speak to their senior leadership team to influence them. And I know based on our conversations before Tom, I just put these um, together as, uh, as I guess kind of top steps. So in terms of of, I guess for the audience when you're pitching this engagement or activities to your senior leadership team as with anything always put yourself in their shoes but these uh, kind of the security the rec risk of reputation and inability to collect data Tom are things that you've mentioned to me before so yeah. how should how should um, people in this in this um, webinar address these to their senior leadership teams? The um, inability to collect data is a really fun one, um, which is to say that we, when people donate to a fundraising page, we really try hard not to collect as, well, we try to collect as little data as possible, which is, which I get charities say, no, what, I need, I need this data. How are we supposed to market them to get more money out of them? And that's, that's not the main objective. In the same way that when you get a bucket collection at a train station, you're not asking them to fill out a form saying what their age, sex, and where they live is. Um, so we try to treat these as people, they, they want to get their donation through as quickly as possible so you know email address uh you know if they've got if, they can, if they've got their phone it's it's thumbprint and it's done um with the donation amount so they try it's about getting it through as quickly as possible so that they can make another donation effectively mm. um so data is, is you know we we really try to um ask for as little as possible from the person making the donation um, in terms of risk to reputation, it's a question that comes up a lot, um, although less and less, actually, which is fabulous, but things like Grand Theft Auto, oh my god, what if someone plays a game where there's murder? Um, it's never been a problem. Um, people fundraising typically are actually really lovely people. Like, if they're not lovely people, they're probably not going to fundraise for you anyway. And then if they are playing something like that, have the conversation. And if they don't want, if they, you know, they don't have to do it. You, and worst case scenario, you have the ability to turn the fundraising page off, so they're not doing it for you. But they have, they have to meet the guidelines of YouTube and Twitch, so chances are they won't be swearing or it will be marked as 18 plus anyway, so someone will be prompted before they view it. So the, the, the risks that I come across, basically I've got answers for all those questions whenever they come in, because I get them quite a lot. And it's mainly from um, sort of shocking headline information. Yeah. You know, like uh, I played Grand Theft Auto once in 2006 and now I'm a murderer. It's, it's not really quite like that. Um, and security because I know someone asked a question on this earlier especially regarding TikTok and data and um, stuff yeah. like that so is that something that charities should be worried about in terms of the I guess um, fraud or um, young children using that's, credit cards? Yeah that's a thing like I, there has been a, a really sharp rise in fundraising cases across the world not solely in the uk or even where people are sort of doing you know covid fundraisers and they're just using a, a gofundme and it's going to their own personal account or something like that which i really don't i mean that well each their own whatever but um from a forward perspective uh if if someone's fundraising on tilsfer we don't hold on to the money the money just goes directly to the charity straight away um and every charity is vetted that we work with so it's um previously that it has been open to fraud um, before we came along. The reason we came along was because people were fundraising on the likes of PayPal, etc., putting the money in their own bank account and then sending it on to the charity afterwards because there was no other way of doing it in a way that they could also do the polls and stuff like that. And so, um, 
and and obviously that's really really unregulatable uh you know we can you can see people raising a couple of hundred grand quite easily and you know that maybe they do choose to keep a little bit skim some off the top we, we there's no way of telling so yeah it's um and in terms of working across organizations so i guess one thing that has really um come to the fore through our conversations is this can't just be siloed into the individual giving team or the digital fundraising team particularly with that crossover of sponsorship sales with corporate so um, yeah. I guess anyone that's on here that's having these conversations if you're part of a large charity or even a, a you know mid-size or smaller having that cross-organization working group is so key um, and forgetting for getting sign off as well Tom I'm sure you've had many fun meetings with finance directors and procurement directors Yes, I have. <laughs> um, but you need to pull those those people into the conversations initially before you before you start building out your strategy because if they won't sign off on this there's no point in in going further um and then one size doesn't fit all so we've talked a bit about that before tom what if you've mentioned when you find reaching out to an influencer you should do so if there's a direct connection can any charity access streaming and gaming fundraising or will it just not work for others? Uh, I mean, I, I, if you'd asked me a year, a year ago, I might have said no, but actually uh, everything's changed and uh, it's open to anyone really. Um, like actually the British Red Cross, they've got um, the English Chess Federation are doing a fundraiser for them. They're not, I mean, they're, they're not, natural live streamers i don't even know if they're doing a live stream but they've raised seven grand between them just by playing chess that's awesome um you've got so i think when reaching out like if you are trying to reach out to the talent speak to your celebrity manager um you know get them on board if, if you've got that if you've got the luxury of that as a charity or if you've got you know these big names who are already on board then do that um the uh, I can't remember what the point I was going to make is. Yeah, uh, the other point about the silos and stuff like that, definitely breaking them down and making it broad. Oh, that was the other thing. Um, some charities have invested in a digital community manager, mm. which I, I see as, as a really logical thing. A lot of charities that have been successful have done it in America, and they've got teams of people now. But with things like Discord and Twitter and this sort of stuff, being able to manage and field those communications, answer the questions, um, and build that community because these guys they're from the streaming world at very least and the Twitter world are really, really community focused. They love their, you, like you follow them on Twitter and they're all just in love with each other. It's lovely. It's a really happy, friendly space. Sorry, just in terms of for those of you who are, this is a new area to them, when you think of community fundraising or community, yes. you'll, you'll naturally think of either regionally based fundraisers or people that work with community group. So, um, whereas in the kind of the gaming or the digital version of community, it's talking about those those online communities coming together. So slightly different kind of terminology, um, if, if there's any confusion around that. Um, and then for, oh, Tom has mentioned a few really successful um, campaigns. So in the wrap up, email that I send around after this will include um, include a couple of those names so that you can go and then look up look at them and um, and do your research and then Tom just one because we've literally run out of time but in terms of Lydia's question just for a small charity how what would the first steps be to um, to setting up a, a gaming or live streaming situation kind of campaign what would you suggest as kind of three three maybe first steps fabulous just saw the question in there now so um, to do that uh, to start entering that sphere uh, first, look at what you've currently look at your current offering and assess the charity thing there. See what thing. I don't particularly like uh, the you know game for twenty four hours for us or something like that as a as a challenge necessarily. Um, it can be quite alienating um, uh, and and sort of somewhat disengaging. So I would consider. Um, look at which of your most social channels are, are currently doing the best. I let's say you've got four thousand followers on Twitter or something like that. Have a go at doing a fundraiser yourself. Um, I think that's a really important thing to do. Uh, I'm just working with uh, a small charity who um, is, were kind of struggling to get it, so they just set up a fundraising page, raised about three hundred quid in about half an hour, which was fabulous. Um, but but because they were so green to it, so new to it, they had to. I, I was just like, Do you know what? The best way is to have a go. Um, mm -hmm because then it becomes a lot easier to talk about as well. 
Right. Um, and so guys, we are, we are over time. So I'm really sorry, but um, it's been enlightening as always to listen to you, to you, Tom, and I hope that you have all enjoyed it. So at the end of this, I will email around the slides so that you can have a little look through those at your own leisure and a couple of the campaigns that um, Tom's mentioned that have been really successful uh, so that you've got, got a few kind of go-to points. Um, and then the recording will be put on YouTube anyway, so that you can watch this back and kind of pick up anything that you might have missed out on. If you have enjoyed today, please do post about us and it on um, LinkedIn or Twitter or Instagram. Um, it's all, all of our handles are at Ashby Jenkins Recruitment. Um, and yeah, any any kind of uh, feedback is really, really welcome. So get posting on, on there, let, let everyone know you've enjoyed it. And, um, and I'll also CC Tom into that email so that you can reach out to him directly. Um, and I will pick up with Sarah as well and then share a bit more detail on what she's done. Awesome. Oh yeah, sorry. <laughs> it was still alive. That's all right. I was uh, like, lovely okay. to see everyone. And yeah, any questions, um, you know, feel free to just drop me a line. Um, Perfect. Cool. Excellent. All right. Thank you everyone. Take care. Bye. Bye.